This week on Roadmap, William Lowe and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, eSTEM and how you use it in stroke recovery. Um, normally, the things that we talk about don't have any um, downside, but uh, you have to be a little careful using eSTEM on yourself, and there's some counterindications where you wouldn't want to use it, so I'm just going to go over those real quick. Uh, let's see, we got open wounds, burns, skin lesions, systematic vascular impairment diseases such as systematic systemic lupus, erythematosis, thrombo, deep, thromb, deep vein thrombosis, all those seem to have to do with circulation lower limb amputations, cardiac pacemaker, and that might also include any other implant, implanted devices. I don't know specifically about um, uh, loop recorders or baclofen pumps, but you sh if you have any of those things or you suspect you might not be a good candidate for it in your current condition, you should talk to your doctor and therapist, which you need to do anyway about before you engage in any kind of a um, e-STEM program because it's not the simplest thing and you need some education before you start it to find out uh, a little bit more. It's not something you should um, do on, on your own. So um, I don't know much about it. So we decided we'd do a little Q and A thing. Uh, I did not use e in my recovery, nor did I learn about it to uh, use it to help other stroke survivors. So uh, I don't know a whole lot except what I've heard from other stroke survivors. Oh, yeah. One other thing was uh, one, speaking of other stroke survivors, I have a friend who was taken off of his stem when he got cancer. Uh, he had chemotherapy. I can't swear that's for all chemotherapy, but if you're on chemotherapy, you better check with your doctor first, because I know uh, this friend of mine was take, taken off. So um, you need to work with somebody. Uh, I guess we'll start off, William, with um, well, what, what's it good for? What does it do? How does it work? How do you use it? And that's about four uh, questions. Well, uh, yeah, sure. So first and foremost, I just want to preface this to, to all the folks who are watching this, that everything I'm sharing with you guys is based on my personal experience and what I've personally seen from helping to coach other stroke survivors in their journey, in their recovery after stroke. I'm a big fan of electrical stimulation because what electrical stimulation does in your recovery, if you use it as a tool in your toolbox, is it basically gives your brain the experience of what it feels like and looks like to perform a movement just like it would have done before you actually had your stroke. And as we know in recovery after stroke, a lot of recovery is driven through experience-dependent plasticity, which is basically immersing your brain in the, in the experience of what it feels like to do something before something, something which you usually would have done before your stroke. Um, and the reason why your brain learns mainly from experience is because it tends to remember a lot better, which is the reason why you tend to remember certain events in your life, such as you know, the first time you had a kiss, the first time you, you know, the first, maybe that time you got into a crash, crash or a traumatic accident, ex, et cetera. Now, why electrical stimulation is good is because what we know about the brain in recovery after stroke is that obviously your brain loses, loses some connections or some connections get weaker when you actually have a stroke. So what happens with electrical stimulation is you use electricity to to teach your brain how to create a direct line of communication from the brain to learn how to turn on and turn off muscles just like it used to before you had a stroke and what this does essentially is over time it teaches your brain to strengthen up these connections which were lost after your stroke or create new connections which 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 probably weren't there after you had your stroke anyway. So in a sense, I want you to imagine the uh, connection in, in in your brain as kind of like the uh, PVC tubing that that you see surrounding the uh, electricity cables that that you use when you when you use electrical appliances. 
So what electrical stimulation does is it thickens this tubing over time through a process which is called which is called synaptic plasticity in that it it strengthens your the 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 connections in your brain which you use to turn on and turn off muscles and perform movements just like you used to before you had your stroke. So that's why I'm a huge fan of electrical stimulation. Um not only because it helps to strengthen up connections in your, in your brain to perform movements like you did before your stroke and also teach your brain how to how to uh, refine your movements, but also because, in a sense, at the same time, when you use electrical stimulation correctly, it can also help you overcome spasticity and help, help you get out of situations where, for example, your hand is brought up in a fist all the time and you're not quite sure what you need to do in order to get your hand into a more neutral position where your fingers are a little bit more open. And that really comes down to obviously teaching your brain how to regulate those signals between the brain and the muscle. And obviously with electrical stimulation, when you're using electricity to teach your brain how to correctly contract and relax the muscles just like it would have before your stroke, then you're sort of guiding your brain towards how to uh, regulate those signals a lot better so that it can overcome that spasticity. And as we know, that spasticity is often caused by muscles which are overexcited, and this is the result of them receiving too many signals from your brain. So if you connect the two together, electrical stimulation, it teaches your brain how to regulate those signals. And then in turn, the benefit of that is obviously relieving some of that spasticity so that you can get out of situations such as a situation where your hand is brought up in a fist like this all the time. So that's basically the premise of why I'm a big fan of electrical stimulation um, because it is a good facilitator of motor learning. In other words, teaching your brain how to develop or learn new movements after you've had a stroke and I guess strengthen up those connections which might have been weakened after your stroke or even create new ones out of thin air because maybe maybe your brain doesn't know how to initiate that connection to turn on the muscle, which it never would have been able to turn on after your stroke or maybe it lost the ability to after you had your stroke. So, so that's... So in a nutshell, and you can tell I've been really thorough and I've probably repeated myself quite a few times, that's really the my reason behind why I'm a big fan of electrical stimulation. A lot of this is theoretical. Um, and it's also the reason why electrical stimulation is so effective because what I find in recovery of the stroke is that by taking a approach which is backed by neuroscience, um, in that you're taking on an approach where you're working from the inside out um, by 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 strengthening up connections or creating new connections in your brain um, from an external stimulus, such as electrical stimulation, then it can do wonders for your recovery after stroke. Okay. So, you know, if you, um, a lot of people hear about other people doing it, read about uh, E-STEM and such. How does somebody get started? As I mentioned before, it's not exactly something you can uh, do on your own without uh, some help, unless you're quite the researcher and experimenter. And of course, it always you know, we always benefit from uh, talking to people who know a lot about it. So, I guess you know you would start with um, your therapist. Some therapists use these stem on people; others don't. So. How do you, if you think it's going to benefit you, how do you get started? Uh, you, you go to your therapist. How do you, you know, do they, do they, um, you need some kind of unit to do it at home as well as some training. So how does somebody get started on this if they think it would do them some good? Uh, yeah, well, first and foremost, um, first and foremost, I would look, electrical stimulation isn't for everyone. It, there are some cases where if I was a survivor, if I was a particular type of stroke survivor in a particular type of situation, I wouldn't use electrical stimulation. For example, if I was a stroke survivor and I had a pacemaker, I probably would be quite conservative with electrical stimulation because 
the use of electrical stimulation might actually interfere with the with the electrical current in the pacemaker at the same time and that might put you in a really um dangerous situation so that's so that's a case where i wouldn't use electrical stimulation and i also want to use electrical stimulation in other scenarios where maybe you're putting the electrodes front and back where it's where it's where it's in front of your chest only because your heart is obviously there and you don't want that current passing you 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 don't want there to be a risk of any current passing through your heart or even touching your heart so so when it comes to electrical stimulation i would only i would only recommend using electrical stimulation in a situation where where you're as far away from the heart as possible um and you know for sure and you know for sure that that you're targeting the exact same muscles that you want to target. So in that case, if you want to get started, I would, I would, I would definitely go see. I would definitely run it by your physical therapist first. If you have a cardiologist, definitely run it by them as well. Um, there may be some exceptions. Um, I'm not too sure about this, um, but if you are in a pacemaker and it's something you want to explore, again, this is just a tool for your stroke recovery. Then you then I highly recommend that you run it by your physical therapist or occupational therapist or cardiologist first, cardiologist. just to see their thoughts. Um, obviously to get a, a second opinion, second or third opinion, um, to see what they think before you you are uh, you give it a try. Okay, well I th I think of it mostly in terms of just where I see people using it and mostly on hands and wrists and arms and things. Uh, a few people use it on their um, leg and uh, foot, uh, foot, ankle, legs. Uh, so most of the use that I see is in the extremities. So um, yeah, and I guess that's far away from uh, your heart. Um, so What's it? What I mean, how, how do you learn uh, where to put the pads? That seems to be the biggest uh, mystery to to um, a lot of folks. Um, I've seen people who um, uh, have have taken and used a sharpie, which will last a couple of weeks, and drawn around the pads. So when they go home from physical therapy, they can put the pads in the same place. Uh, I know somebody that uh, was talking about tattoos getting tattoos but it seems like that's extreme because hopefully you would move on to where you didn't need to put the pads in those places because you recovered and you'd be stuck with the tattoos anyway um ha, ha, you know as an outsider you know i look at people and, and and there's a lot of questions in the groups about people who people use east stem in a lot of ways that I, i'm I question whether they should be doing it uh, at all because they don't know anything about pad placement or duration or settings or any of that. I guess they're just willing to um, experiment on themselves, see if they can get some kind of movement. So how do you learn about pad placement? And is there any danger in putting pads in the wrong place, tr uh, triggering the wrong muscles or something like that? I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, first and foremost, I would, I would, I would say that, I mean, speaking for myself because I learned my anatomy when I was at OT school. It's actually quite easy for me to identify places where to put the electrodes because of the anatomy. Um, but like I said earlier, you don't want to mess around with putting the pads anywhere you want. Like I said, you don't want them close to the heart because if you do it too close to the heart, then it's 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 going to be potentially dangerous um so you definitely want to target the extremities um but one thing you can do um one little trick you can do is obviously you can try to perform the movement which you want to replicate with electrical stimulation on your non-affected side first and see where the muscle contracts so for example you could try to flex your fingers on your you could try to flex your fingers on your um on your non-affected side, and you might see that the middle part of your forearm actually starts to contract, which is the part which is closest to where they drew blood in you in hospital. It might be the lower half, it might be the 
about a third of the way up the middle of your forearm, um, which is basically the flexor surface or 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 basically where most of the muscles which you use to flex your wrist and also your fingers are located. So so that's so that's one technique. Um and that's just an example. Another one is obviously if you're targeting the the muscles that you use to extend your fingers, you could try to extend your fingers on your not affected side. And as you're doing that, you can see that on the outside of your forearm that you might see some muscle some um muscle switches on the outside of your forearm. And that might give you a basis on where to target. Um, but definitely in terms of locating where to put the pads, um, I would I would recommend that I would recommend that you I mean I think the Sharpie idea is a good idea, but in a sense, obviously as if you're in a situation where where you you are where you're not familiar with all the muscles, um that's 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 where I would start. Um I don't know because because I learned my anatomy, so I just know mine. So I just know where to locate the pads. But that's where I'll start is I would look for I would I would I'll try to perform a muscle contraction on the non-affected side and then try and locate the exact lo same location on your affected side at the same time. Um so that's so that's where I would start. But if that's okay. but if you can't do that, obviously run it by your occupational therapist or your physical therapist. Um and if they know their anatomy, then they should be at least be able to show you where to put the pads and then obviously from there you can get a get a sharpie to to obviously make a mark on where where they put the pads or at least take a photo so that you have something to refer to when you get home well it's it's, um, it's not so simple for somebody who had a stroke six months or two years ago who thinks it might be good for them because like your fingers connect and muscles move way down here by your elbow a lot of people don't know that they don't um, your average stroke survivor isn't going to know anything about anatomy, so he's going to either have he or she, sorry. Uh, so they're going to have to um, either get the information from um, their PTOT. Yeah, taking pictures is a good idea. Doesn't give you the quite the same exactness of the sharpie, but a sharpie will wear off in a, in a week or so, about three or four showers, about all the last. And you can scrub it all you want the first couple showers, but eventually it'll go away. But maybe by then you've um, learned where that one is, but then you want to you get that muscle moving, you want to do the next one. People eventually get discharged from insurance. Uh, I've heard a number of people say that, uh, what's their name, Axel Guard. Uh, and I've looked it over. They've got about 80 pad placement things. They're one of the people like Flint Rehab and Sabo who've decided that if they supply good information to people, that drives them to their site. And, they, of course, they sell pads. And uh, like Sabo and Flint also um, sell uh, stroke recovery products. And all three of them seem to do subscribe to the whole thing about Hey, if we put good information out there for people, um, then they'll come to our site and maybe they'll see our, our products. I've had a number of people tell me that they use that particular site. So I guess there are some resources out there. You know, it's it's hard enough to figure out how to do a home therapy program. People are kind of bewildered by the and overwhelmed by the stroke and everything they got coming at them. And, you know, to me, um, the whole East End thing just takes that up a notch because it's not intuitive. People don't know their anatomy. And uh, I don't know, is, can you do any harm? With uh, That's a question. If somebody doesn't know what they're doing, can they do it uh, other than, you know, some of the contraindications we talked about getting them close to the heart? Can you... Put them in the wrong place, stimulate the wrong muscles, and work against your recovery. I mean, I, that might be a stupid question, but I don't know the answer to it because I don't know much about this. Is there any uh, danger? Well, I mean, well, I mean, one thing I one thing I want to add to that is you definitely want to keep keep an eye on how much you're using electrical stimulation. So I've heard, so you definitely don't want to be doing electrical stimulation for longer than twenty minutes. Um, I mean, I've heard stories of people who have done it for 
a long, long time. Um, I personally recommend 10 minutes at a time, only because 10 minutes doesn't over fatigue the muscle to the point where where it would cause any damage. Um, I have heard stories, I have had stories where people have used electrical stimulation too much and they actually get peripheral nerve damage only because the electricity desensitizes the nerves and it and it can make you oversensitive. Um so um that's 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 where I would I would definitely um be be uh, very cautious of is just the duration you're using it. Um, you might, it might be practical to think that the more you do of something, eventually the signal is going to get through. But in the case of electrical stimulation, quality actually trumps quantity. So if you can do 10 minutes of a targeted electrical stimulation placement, which directly addresses your current situation and where you are currently in your recovery, that will be much better than trying to go against the grain with an electrical stimulation placement, which isn't directly addressing the issue at hand. Um, so, for example, if your hand is if your hand is brought up in a fist like that, I would not recommend that you go for an electrical stimulation placement, which will try to open up your fingers, um, because because your uh, but rather I would aim to use an electrical stimulation placement to address that tightness in your fingers. So something which teaches your brain how to relax relax those fingers is a lot better. Okay, so what what would you do? Tri somehow trigger the fingers to open, or you're saying you wouldn't use it? Well, I would. Of... Well, I would work on grip rather than. Well, I would. I would. I would. I would work on teaching your brain how to how to strengthen how how to flex your fingers and also relax your fingers at the same time, rather than opening your fingers. How to cl close and open them? Yeah. How do you get like going? That. I guess yeah, we got a lot of people with balled up fists. They hear well, about. I would, well, 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 in that situation, personally, I would, I would target the flexes, the wrist flexes, um, the wrist flexes, and possibly the finger flexes, depending on the person's situation. And I would use that as a starting point um, because that would at least teach your brain how to relax. Relax a closed fist so that you're not brought up all the time. Whereas if you try and go against the grain and strengthen up the extensors, your extensors are naturally a lot weaker than your flexors. So even if you are strengthening up the extensors, then your fingers are likely to go get into a situation like this where they don't fully extend, but rather they end up clawing up. So there's no, so you're not really teaching your brain how to completely relax the fingers. You're just encouraging, you're just encouraging your fingers to flex in and your wrist to go up. So that's where, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's just a side thing, which, which, which I would recommend. Um, so it's interesting because, you know, in my hand recovery and what I tell other people is to actually work on the extensors and not the flexors um, because they're weaker. So you're saying if you simulate them too much, you might get this part open, but these, but you're not not talking to the rest of the fingers. Yeah, well, 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 Raph. What I'm saying is that when you stimulate the flexors, the machine, when you use electrical stimulation, it's going to work in such a way that it teaches your brain how to flex, and then the muscles are going to relax, and then the fingers are going to naturally, and the flexors are naturally going to relax. So you're teaching okay. your brain how to relax the flexors. The reason why most of the time people have a thumb and palm deformity, where their hand is closed and closed fist like that. Is because is because they don't know how to relax the flexors and their their flexors, right? So if you teach your brain how to relax your finger flexors, then it's likely you won't be like that all the time, but you'll be in you'll progress towards a more open situation. Okay, so if I understand this right, you use the e stem to trigger the closure, and when you let go of it, then your fingers are going to naturally open, and then you want to like try and use mental imagery or something to think about it to. Yeah, yeah, That's something like question. that. Okay, that there is another question. I would assume that you know mental imagery or any uh, which works when you don't have e stem. That's for those who haven't watched us talk about that a few weeks ago. That's when you tr try and make the connections by thinking about it when you passively move your hand um, 
and it does work. Um, so I would assume that any type of mental imagery or whatever that you did in coordination with the stem would be good. In other words, if you, if you tighten up that hand, then when you let the electricity goes off and it opens, if you were thinking about open, 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 and working with it, I would think that would be beneficial. Is yeah, yeah, that that's it. Good? And yeah, that's it. And the way I like to think about electrical stimulation, it's 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 like it's almost like the training wheels that you would put on a push bike when you're learning how to ride a bike for the first time. So some people, some people who didn't have a natural sense of balance, uh, myself included, when they learned how to ride a bike for the first time, they would need some training wheels just to teach the brain how to get a sense of balance for the first time. And over time, as their brain calibrated to learn how to balance um, with the aid of those training wheels, then eventually you took the training wheels off and you were able to ride by yourself. So the way I like to think of electrical stimulation is in a sense, it's like your training wheels for your recovery after stroke. It guides your brain on how to perform that movement and exposes your brain to the experience of what it should look like and feel like to perform a movement you would have done before your stroke. In other words, it gives your brain a strong reference point on how to refine and develop a movement develop that blueprint in your brain, which is responsible for that movement like you had before your stroke. And then once you get the movement back, um, once once you get voluntary movement back, no matter how small, it could be a sixth of an inch, then it's your job to dial in into that signal of what it feels like to send that signal from your brain to, to turn on that muscle like you would have before your stroke. So generally speaking, the way that electrical stimulation works, if you've done it correctly and if you're lucky, is if you try out a pad placement, the next day, um, generally what you would expect is if you try to do the exact same movement as you did with the electrical stimulation, let's let's say if you were aiming for a movement which is used to it, which let's say if you were using the electrical stimulation to teach your brain how to extend your wrist, for example, the next morning, you might find that you might be able to extend your wrist maybe, maybe a, a 16th of an inch, right? And that 16th of an inch can be possibly improved to about an half an inch if you just keep reminding your brain how to send that signal through, either through electrical stimulation or just through through natural effort or 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 just through natural effort on your own part as well. Okay, well that kind of answers my next question, which was what it would have been. Um, you know, how do you you can't walk around you know, with these stem on you every time you want to move. So you somehow have to transition off of it. So once you get what we've called in the past uh, flicker of movement, small amounts of voluntary movement, then what you do is you work with the stem. You start um, seeing if you can build on that voluntary mo movement and then go back to the stem build on it go back to the stem build on it until eventually you can move it pretty much without the stem is that the is that the uh the desired um trajectory on this uh yeah definitely 100 percent um so so i like to refer to to um the electrical stimulation as stuff you would do in the clinic. So, so any athlete when they're when they're training for a sport, they would have time spent in the gym where they're refining their muscles and their and maybe they're con conditioning themselves for the game, right? So electrical stimulation is things is something that you would do outside of your daily life just to remind yourself, remind your brain how to send that signal to the muscles correctly. Um, because Let's say you do get a flicker of movement and you're able to to uh, voluntarily move your hand outside in real life. It doesn't mean that, that the quality of that movement will always be 100%. Um, there will be days where maybe you'll be really tired and rather than opening your fingers, your, your, your flexors might actually claw in a little bit more because maybe you're using too much effort to, to open your fingers, which is something which happens with a lot of strokes. Arms. So in that case, it might mean that it might mean that maybe maybe you might need to use the electrical stimulation to remind your brain how to relax those flexes again. Um, so you revisit the electrical stimulation and then you come back to 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 what it looks like in daily life to see 
to to see if the application of the movement is a lot better in real life without the electrical stimulation or if if you need more of a reminder from the electrical stimulation to help you with those movements. Let's say if you're in a situation where you are trying to to pick up something and your thumb keeps clawing in like this. So in that situation, what I would suggest is obviously use electrical stimulation to teach your brain how to flex the thumb down so it doesn't curl in and buckle, but rather it comes down completely flat. Um, just so you can keep reminding your brain that it needs to turn on the, the correct muscle and the and the what and what it feels like to send that signal from your brain to turn on that correct muscle. And you keep doing that until it becomes natural. Now, on some days, let's say if you're picking up a heavy weight, your thumb actually might buckle instead of staying straight, obviously because of the constraints of the task or the exercise that you're doing. Um, quite often in recovery after stroke, if you find yourself under a uh, under a, a situation where there's a lot of pressure, maybe the weather is a little bit cold or maybe you're picking up a heavy weight, your brain might turn on or might use more effort than is necessary, and that might affect the uh, quality of your movements, and it might cause you to do things like buckle your thumb, or turn on, or use too much brain power to turn on muscles at the same time. So in that case, if you get in a situation where you're, let's say you're doing weights, and you've encouraged your brain to get into some bad habits, you might need electrical stimulation to teach your brain how to refine those signals a lot better before you revisit before you revisit um, doing things in real life without the electrical stimulation. So in a sense, what you mentioned, Ralph, it is correct. It is a it is sort of a back and forth process where you get the movement back from the electrical stimulation, whether this be a flicker of movement or actual voluntary movement, you try it out and you test it out in real life. See if you can see if you can do something as simple as open a doorknob, or like pick up a grocery bag and maintain your grip. Um, and if you can't do it so well, then you know it's time to revert to the machine. And then again, you do the machine. You go back to the task that you're aiming to achieve, and then you might see improvements in between. And you keep going back and forth until you feel that you've reached a level where you're able to perform the thing in real life. And you're satisfied by how well you're doing it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it seems like something that, you know, I was moving my thumb. You got a couple different motions. It was trying to feel the muscles. You can watch the tendons. You got things going on up above your wrist. And if I do, um, like, basically up and down or crosswise, it seems like we're using this big old muscle here underneath your thumb. Another movement you got is straight out from your thumb. So you got basically three movements. I know one, two, and then three crosswise. Um, so I'd be lost as to where to put the, the, the pad. So it seems to me this is something that uh especially in the early days especially before you know very much about this as i guess as you go on you might gain some experience that would um make you better at knowing what you need to do based on working with your therapist uh, on the muscles and muscle groups that you're trying to get um back but it it it's, it doesn't seem like um it's something you should just um go out on your own and, and try, especially if you can uh, um, overstimulate the um, nerves and cause yourself problems. So that would be my takeaway from all this. Um, uh, get some help, learn how to do it, do it in a supervised uh, way um, until such time as you, well, your insurance can kick out. Some of us would stay forever in therapy to get better and to learn, but insurance will kick out. So you might get back your motion. You might get enough knowledge where you feel like you can do it on your own. You might get kicked out of insurance. So it's like a lot of things we profess, you know, uh, working with your physical therapist to learn all you can about regular exercises and stretching in your recovery. So this would be something similar where 
if you think it's something that benefits you, I guess you would jump on it so you have enough time before you run out of insurance to learn something to keep it going on your own. So, um, if you anything, do you have anything else, William? You want to add? Uh yeah. So, I mean, just one last last thing I want to add is electrical stimulation works best when it's strategic, um, when it's strategically done. And the like, reason why I say that is that it works best when it specifically targets the muscles, which are maybe stopping you from being able to progress in your recovery. So if this if this is spasticity, um, then you want to use electrical stimulation to directly address the spasticity first before you have a look at other things to to uh, to help you in your recovery. Um, that's 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 the only thing I would add. And like I said earlier. Electrical stimulation allows your brain to have a direct line of communication to the exact same the exact muscle which you want to wake up in your recovery after stroke so that you can teach your brain how to turn on that muscle and relax it just like you would have before you had your stroke anyway. And just like with Ra what Ralph said, as soon as you see movement, you've got to jump on it because electrical stimulation, if you're lucky, and if you do wake up the next morning with movement, it will only give you the opportunity to jump on that movement maybe once or twice. So you want to be really cognizant and really observant with what types of movements you're getting back after you use electrical stimulation. If you do get a movement back, definitely jump on it. Um, otherwise, otherwise, you might not see that movement again. So that's, that's anything else I have to add. Um, yeah. Okay, well, and you were obviously talking about voluntary movement because you can probably hook up the machine and make it move your muscles um, forever. But the point is not to um, have a machine that moves your muscles. The point is to make the connections again. So it's kind of like a, a jump starter, if you will. You can use it to jump start, but you have the responsibility to um, jump on it and do um, the exercise is necessary to get back the voluntary motion anyway that's my takeaway so unless you got anything else william uh that, that was a, a bit of an overview this is kind of a fairly deep subject but uh, there's a bit of a overview on uh, how it works and and how you can uh engage in to, uh, doing it yourself and that would be to um uh, seek some supervision so you can learn because it's a com fairly complex subject. So unless you got anything else, William, uh, we'll, we'll end it there. Uh, I mean, I think the only thing I have to add is is using electrical stimulation. Um, sometimes it works best if you know how to, how to adjust the settings of your machine. So some machines you can adjust the electrical current in such a way that it creates a response in your brain for recovery um, because muscle fibers and muscle neurons in in your brain they respond to a certain frequency of electricity and if you adjust that frequency on your machine then it can be beneficial in your recovery as well and maybe ralph can do maybe a write-up or something but just aside the settings i like to use is 150 as a pulse width and 30 30 as a pulse frequency um, so maybe Ralph, you can put that somewhere for the people who are interested in looking at electrical stimulation, or maybe they are currently using electrical stimulation. They could they could tweak around those settings with their occupational therapist or their physical therapist. But other than that, that's 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 the only thing I have to add. Um, those those are the settings which I've seen success with, not adjusting myself, but in other stroke swabbers as well. Um, but other than that, yeah, I don't think there's anything else to add. Um, Okay. Yep. So thanks everybody out there for tuning in. And William, thanks again for as always for your time. And I guess we'll see everybody next time on Roadmap.